Welcome to the Career Metis Podcast, and I'm your host, Nisar Ahmed. Uh, I am the founder and editor of the blog, careermetis.com, and this is episode 48 of the Career Metis Podcast. And this episode is part of the A Day in the Life of series, where in each of these episodes, I have conducted interviews with individuals from a particular career or profession. And the goal of these episodes is for the audience to understand the inner workings of, of a particular job. So... If they wanted to get into that field, they have a clearer understanding. And for today's episode, I'm speaking with a human resources leader. And our guest's name is Nick Goblish. Um, He will be sharing his experience, how he got started in this profession, where he stands today, some of the benefits, some of the things he enjoys, some of the challenges, and so on. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Nassar. First of all, did I get your name right? Is Nick? You had it. No, that was a home run, home run. That, that's good. That's, I always make it a point to get the name right. One of the first few questions, where are you calling from? Uh, I am in South Jersey, South New Jersey. Okay. Uh, so when you say South New Jersey, is it, uh, I've been to New Jersey. I've been to Jersey City before. That is, <laughs> well, that's, that is, that's, that's North Jersey. See, there's a, there's a line that runs through New Jersey and South Jersey is very different than North Jersey. I grew up in the c- central Jersey, but when you start going down to South Jersey, it becomes more Atlantic City, Philadelphia than it is Jersey City and New York and Hoboken and all those towns above that line. Okay. Uh, so uh, one of the questions, one of my favorite questions is always to ask people this. Can you tell us uh, something uh, like a fun fact about South Jersey that people would not know unless they have been there or lived there? Well, I mean, I can speak for my town. I live in a town called Hamilton, New Jersey, and Hamilton is actually the blueberry capital of the world, they say. Uh, Hamilton and the when you think of Jersey being a garden state, if you drive up to Jersey City, Newark and all those places, most of those you know TV shows that you see, like The Sopranos that show New Jersey, that, that really isn't a, a core piece of New Jersey. But when you come down here, the farmlands stretch very, very far and vast. Uh, there's mint leaf farms down here, blueberry farms. They kick up probably in the next month or so. The farming's going to start there. Peach orchards, it's amazing. You can drive 10 minutes from here and hit five or six farm stands and get fresh corn. Well, I don't think the corn's ready, but fresh at the time, fresh corn, fresh peaches, fresh tomatoes. It's awesome. There's uh, plenty of uh, good organic food in, in South Jersey. I don't know if... Uh, your listeners are are from this area, but as far as a fun fact, when you grow up in central northern Jersey, you don't really think of that, uh, that there are all this produce is from down here. But, yep, you can go pretty much a stone throw away from here and eat some pretty good uh, healthy food. That's actually an excellent fun fact. I, I'm sure – I don't. I did not know that. I've been to Jersey a few times. Of course, that's a totally different part of Jersey, as you mentioned. Yeah. Blue, blueberry capital of the world. That sounds really exciting. <laughs> um so the ne- my question, the first question for this interview, I would like to hear your introduction. If you could tell us about a little bit about your career and what do you do? Well, I'm a I'm an HR executive. Uh, I recently started. Uh, I'd rather talk more about my career than where I work because my career has has bounced me to several types of, of industries since I graduated college. Back when I decided to study uh, a subject in college. Uh, that was the first time I could actually pick what I wanted to study. I was pretty involved in things like honors English and honors chemistry and physics and AP calculus. All this stuff kind of came easy for me, but it wasn't any fun. There was a level of creativity that I, I wanted to apply in, in what I did. So I completely dishonored my entire family who were both uh, – my father was a doctor and his father was a doctor. And I decided to study fine arts and sculpting in college. So I had a background in radio and video and really enjoyed myself in college. But in all that whole process, not to stereotype you know, bohemian artists really just kind of skate through school, uh, I still involved myself in a lot of things where I was able to exercise – a level of leadership that I worked to develop throughout my, even my childhood, you know, from being 
uh, student council president to being the president of my fraternity, I always kind of looked at my ambition and my my way of accelerating whatever I did was there's always another rung to jump up. Uh, the only problem was back in the day when I was in school, I didn't have the right mentors or I didn't have the right competencies to really understand what leadership was. So most of my leadership positions were given to me simply because I worked harder than everybody else. But as I matured, graduated school, realized that it was tough to find a job being a graphic designer at the time. Uh, I simply got into advertising and sales, which a majority of those responsibilities were really building a sales team and interviewing people. So I was able to start building those core HR competencies of building relationships and understanding self-awareness and emotional intelligence and being able to build a core team that uh, believed that I could lead them uh, to the best of my ability. And then uh, as I moved, uh, traveled throughout the, the country and made decisions where I ended up in certain places, I went from becoming a, a simple HR rep where it was just handling administration work. Usually when you start an HR career, you have to understand the paperwork. There's a really big stereotype about HR is they're just the administrators, but still having that leadership desire in the background, the only way for me to get where I wanted to be, whether it be in HR management or HR consulting, was simply to understand everything from benefits administration to hiring, recruiting, training, all that stuff. Again, building those competencies that it's been a long time since I've done those things, and God forbid you ask me to do them again, I would probably do a horrible job in doing that, but I had to start somewhere. But in doing that, I, I built those core competencies, built my, my career from being a recruiter. I worked in, in the casino industry. I worked in the call center telemarketing industry, and then my leadership roles moved from manufacturing to retail to uh, real estate. The best part about my career path is I've always kept – a true uh, target of becoming the best HR leader slash executive I could be, but gaining all this experience about the businesses around me because I'm a true believer in order to be successful as an HR partner, you really need to understand the language that your partners are speaking. So you need to understand the business. You need to understand where they're coming from because it's our job to learn about what they do and help them and support them versus their job learning what we do. Does that make sense? Does that kind of give you an idea in 25 words or less exactly? How I got here? Yeah, th that's actually great because uh, one of the common themes when I do these interviews is it starts off sort of an accidental career, then they start to enjoy it, then they develop and grow. It seems like you're in the same boat. Oh, so, Nassar, I, I shouldn't be here now. There's absolutely no reason I, well, yeah, I should be here. When I graduated college, I was a, an ambitious – I was I was driven, but – I had this this view that I was going to graduate college. I was going to get an hourly job, whether delivering pizzas during the day or at night, sculpt during the day, and then go to jury shows on the weekends, where people would buy my work and I would make you know money hand over fist, and and that was my ambition. But it's just not how it worked. I just happened to fall into this and get good at those those core competencies that make HR people successful. I mean, I'm very very lucky. And then you get a taste for it. Like you said, you get a taste for it of, of what you want to do. And thank God that there's a, there's a career path or a, there's a, a, uh, an industry out there that allows me to, to exercise those skills, which makes it 10 times more rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like over time you started to, you sound very passionate yeah, and it's very important no matter what you do. And you mentioned a few things as you were talking about the last two questions, some of the things you do on a day and basis, but. I'd like to get a clearer idea. What does a day-to-day -day look like for someone in your position today? So I'm an HR vice president. My job as when, when you, and I know I mentioned, you know, you start being a, an, an administrator. Usually they're, the way the HR industries work, the stereotypical titles, when you look at that, if you think of career laddering, people start as HR administrators where they learn, you know, there's little accountability, but uh, for others, or it's really just managing a process that they've been told to do. And then, then you move into what we call HR generalist roles. These are roles that, that you kind of get a taste for everything, not just the administration. You get to learn about benefits, recruiting, uh, training, organizational development, but you're usually supporting an HR manager or an HR director. Then you gain the ability to take on more accountability. And I, that's how I look at HR is just you're, you're growing, you're building a, uh, uh, a toolkit of HR competencies, but you're also building accountability and becoming a leader of others. So uh, you move into an HR management role where you're you're maybe managing. Now you're responsible 
for the development and the performance and the, and the maintenance of, of functions or other people in, in a, an HR department. And then you move to an HR director, which luckily that's when I hit, when I became an HR director, that's when I was able to get a, a powerful mentor that was able to teach me that it's not just about HR, but it's about leading others and taught me those skill sets and those those things I needed to be aware of to lead others. And once you're ready to, to take on even more, uh, moving into an HR executive role or vice president role now puts you in a position at an organization where you're the guy. You're held accountable for how human resources and human capital really affect an organization because you might be able to make widgets, but you need people building those widgets and designing better widgets. And, you know, people come with issues and challenges and their own obstacles. And, and when I look at, you know, an average day as an HR leader, my job is to mitigate obstacles, not only for my team, but also the, the decision makers in an organization. When I show up to work in my position, it's impossible for me to think about anyone other than my team. It's been a long time since I've been to work. This hour where I could walk in and, and just think about myself, sit down and say what I'm going to do. I spent a lot of time dealing with my my employees. I started a new position uh, recently, and, and my job is simply to get to know the people that are in my department. How can I best tap into their strengths to allow me to execute what I think we can do for an organization. You know, it seems really big, but, uh, and I use a lot of big words and HR people, we use a lot of big words to describe what we do, a lot of acronyms, but it's about simply putting people ahead of yourself. My needs are not important. I have people I can go to outside of an organization for that help, but when I'm there, uh, they need to understand that they're the most important things to me in order, and their success is important to me too. You know, it's not just about me becoming successful. I've, I've taken that path. I've, I started as an HR administrator and moved all the way up in my career. Now it's an opportunity to pay it back. And, and the one thing about HR people, we really like developing other HR people. We network. We go to uh, HR professional chapter events where we get to see other people that were like us. Because I think you mentioned before about having someone in HR uh, I don't know if it was our discussion before we started the call. HR is a, we're extremely passionate about what we do and, and it's about people. It's really about helping others, not in a, a very, you know, social worker slash, you know, caregiver type of thing, but you get a taste for helping other people be successful and being part of that success. And it just keeps you moving. It keeps you motivated, keeps you moving through all the mud that we have to deal with from time to time. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think you, uh, you actually answered in your answered a question I was going to ask about an ideal career path. So you mentioned how one can get started, how they can move up, and what are some of the things to expect. So that is a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I can say this too. There is no ideal path. You know, there's a lot of people that that move into this industry that were in operations at an organization that move into this. It's a ch the one thing the the ideal thing I could say, the absolute I can say is it is a choice. It is a choice to do what we do and to be effective. Some people are, are – there's not an HR bone in their body, Hissar, but they actually work in an HR department. I feel that the most successful HR people are the ones that make the choice to do HR because there's so much sacrifice and, and personal investment into being successful in what we do. Well, that sounds totally uh, fair. Thank you. Uh, so – you didn't mention about the path. There are different ways to get there. What about degree and certifications? What are your thoughts on that? I, I, I think, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. I don't know if you're the same thing. So, you know, when we graduated college, it was we at least my perspective was I had to get a job in a mailroom somewhere in order to move up and learn a company. So I still to this day, it's it's amazing how the career works because you start with no experience and you learn and you you stub your toe and you learn and learn and learn and apply everything you learn. Uh, it's it's tough because now people graduate with master's degrees in HR and they expect to get a job right out of school. Uh, I think having a master's degree or or a certification is great, but nothing beats experience in our line of work. Experiential exposure is, is so much more valuable. Application of dealing with certain situations and people and, and changes in an organization or between acquisitions, mergers, to layoffs, to mass hirings, to growth, to development, to rolling out a new learning management system, it, it all becomes invaluable if you can apply your experience. Now, I'm a certified HR professional, but I'm not a senior certified HR professional. I don't think that 
uh, that gives me a disadvantage because I'm, I have a lot of experience, but anyone can, I, I think anyone can be successful in what we do if they can find a fine balance between the tool. I guess you can't, you can't get there with just having one, you know, you can't just have experience and you can't just have a certification or a degree. I don't have a, an HR degree. I, but all I did was work my butt off to try to get very good at what I could do and, and very good at doing the things that no one else wants to do. Because I tell my team every day, any time I've ever worked with or mentored other HR professionals is every day you have to have the courage to do the things that other people don't want to do. And that's that that can go to having a difficult conversation to someone, because if there's anyone out there that dealt has dealt with an HR department, you understand what I mean, where where when you get stuck with an employee, you go to HR or that employee gets stuck dealing with a manager, they go to HR. So we're asked to kind of jump in like supermen to have difficult conversations, to say things the way they need to be said, to help our leaders, business leaders make difficult decisions when people are involved, to mitigate risk and, and, and so on. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but having it's great now that college HR, I didn't think HR was even a major in the college that I went to, but now in order to stay competitive, there's a lot more people fighting for jobs like mine. So having that degree, it's only it's only going to help you in the long run, but to, to get in the door, but to be successful, you really have to have experience, internships, a way to apply or, or be able to tell a story of how you applied your, your experience dealing with people to, in order to be effective in an HR position. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's actually a good way to sum, sum that up. And now you did mention a lot of things. You probably touched on this next question a little bit. I do, I keep, ask, do I keep doing that? Sorry, I keep jumping ahead. No, no, no. That's actually amazing because you make me think about what else that I can ask you, which is amazing. I like I like interviews like this. You mentioned a lot of things that you enjoy. Uh, if you could choose the top three things or top two things that you really enjoy about what you do, what would those be? Probably the first one I mentioned it before was I actually get a physical high from this is helping other people succeed really defining what success looks like to someone. And I'm not talking about success as being a, you know, multi-billion, helping someone become a multi-billion dollar uh, company, helping a company become a multi-billion dollar company. It's simply tapping into people and figuring out what does a win look like? I say that all the time to my team and the managers that I work with and the business leaders that I work with, because uh, being a, a an outsider, a kind of bipartisan third party, it allows you to think differently. You're not invested the way they are, and you can come up with solutions uh, that they might not have thought of or taken the time of. I, I do a lot of my coaching telling people to take a step back, take a step back. So probably the first one is really be, being part of being part of someone's success is really important. The other piece that uh, that I really enjoy about what I do is applying what I know, you know, for for someone who didn't know anything less than 20 years ago now knows all this stuff, I'm able to apply it. You know, when you have a skill set that and you're on a team because HR people are really just people on a team with everyone else. You like to apply what you already know. You like to have the answers that people haven't thought of. It's it's and there's if you can go online and, and if uh, and I'm just one voice, but understanding a lot of people have many different stories about how they ended in HR. Uh, all the experience I have, I get to apply it every day, and it's fun. There's absolutely a, – it's it's so much fun to be – I don't know if anyone has ever said this on your show before, but being unconsciously competent, being good at something you don't know you're good at. There's a, a level of reward in, in doing that. And lastly, I, I, it's amazing to be able to truly tap into people's true self every day. And that sounds cheesy and weird and and, and spiritual, but – it's I get to make a living. I get paid every day to get to know people and, and understand who they are, how they do what they do, their negatives, their positives, and hopefully have an opportunity to influence their direction in a positive way, to be able to move them in a direction, whether it be making a, a, a billion dollar decision on the company or simply helping a manager determine whether or not this person is the right person for the job or, or convincing them that maybe there's one more thing that they need to do with that person to make them successful. That's, and it's different every day. Every day, I've worked in so many different industries, but every day I go to work, it's, it's just different. It's, it's being in tune to, and a lot of all this, and I say all these three things, the most important piece to have and to enjoy all these, all these things is to really know myself. You know, I spent a lot of time uh, being uh, self-awareness exercises, asking mentors what they, what they think of what I'm doing, asking for immediate feedback. 
and I could ask for feedback from someone all the way at the top of a company, Nassar, all the way to the bottom. Uh, and I say bottom, I mean like uh, uh, kind of on the low, uh, uh, more administrative staff level employees because I'm, I'm humble enough to know I don't know everything. I'm never going to know everything. But my father used to tell me it's not what you know. It's where you know how to find it. And if you know the world is your library and people can only – if you ask enough people help you become successful, just as I want to help other people, it makes life a little bit easier to go through or my professional life a little bit easier, less stressful, less pressure put on myself to be perfect uh, because there's no way I got where I am by being perfect. I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes, Oof. but I never made the same mistakes twice, never made the same mistakes twice. So now, of course, I believe that every role has some type of challenge. So for people to be aware, uh, what would you say are some of the challenges one will face in your uh, job or career? Probably the one thing that I've experienced even talking to any HR person is we come to a level, we come to each position we hold with a level of passion that, that goes deep to our bones. And the unfortunate thing is no matter how hard we might try our best to help a business or a, a manager or an employee do their job well, they just don't care. They don't want to hear what we have to say. And that just comes with the territory. That could be, uh, you can only say so much or do so much, but most people don't want to be told what they sh how they should think or do, even though, <laughs> I mean, uh, selfishly, we sometimes think we know more than they do, and we do know more than they do. But some of the most challenging things are probably at the tip top that I could take away is knowing that you could have the best presentation, the best proposal, vetted it the best you can, have the best analytics telling an, an organization the decision they need to make or, or things we need to do with the people at an organization, but they just don't see it the same way and you hit a brick wall. What I've learned in my career is the only way to circumvent that is to figure out another angle. Take a, I've said that before, take a step back, take a step back. I mean, it's tough. Early in my career, I would pull my hair out of my head trying to figure out how best to change a situation. But at the end of the day, you can't change people. You can only figure out a way to get them to think differently about what they do. And that's a key component in any culture I create in my HR department is teaching others how to think differently. Because once they think differently, they, they do things differently. That's pretty much that. If I could come up with a cure to that, that would make my job the the absolute greatest thing on the entire planet to do i wouldn't want to do anything else other than that uh yeah that totally makes sense and uh, so the final question for our interview today nick is uh what advice will you give someone who wants to get into this field today i think it is not an easy field to be in and it evolved drastically the hr was looked at very differently prior to the recession and luckily i was able to adapt H HR can be a, a really great thing one minute and a thing that's expendable the next minute. The biggest thing I would tell anyone deciding to get into this type of profession is one, you have to be extremely flexible. You might have to reinvent yourself 10 different times in order to be effective at whether it be the you're changing an industry or your industry is changing in general because the world, we're a global market. Things change on a dime. There could be a new technology that can put us all out of business and and the industry could disappear. Things from outsourcing to, uh, that's really the outsourcing piece because HR is a cost center. But in order to add value, you have to reinvent yourself. You will, as, as you join this career, when you're in your 20s, you will get older and you will become less marketable because there's uh, more people coming in the pipeline that may know more than you, whether they have access to technology or education that you don't have. The, I, I, uh, there are people in my industry that are dinosaurs because they, they don't, they're doing the same thing they did 30 years ago and it just doesn't work that way. You have to evolve just as fast as business evolves to be effective. Now you'll always have those core competencies, those things that you've either learned in early in your career or you, or you learned in school in, in HR 101. But if you can't reinvent yourself, you will, you will never be able to stay on top of, of the food chain, the HR marketable food chain, because back when I was in school, when I jumped into this career, there weren't a lot of people doing what I do. And now everyone, people are graduating with HR development degrees and organization degrees and going for getting double masters, but I don't have a master's degree, 
Uh, but they're competing against other people with those. In order to stay competitive, if you walk into my office and you want to join my team, you better be ready to tell me what sacrifices you've made, experience you've had, people you've made upset. And most importantly, I ask all my interviews to start, what don't you like about people? Because it's that's the mud we have to get through. People are difficult to deal with, especially when things don't go their way. If you have kids, it's the same thing. You have to learn a lot more about yourself and know how to deal with those people. It's not all helping people all the time. Unfortunately, sometimes we need to make decisions that hurt people. But getting through that and reinventing yourself and building on what you already know is imperative to being being successful. And that's what what got me here now. I mean, I have a new job. I'm learning new things. But without having that that constant uh, question in my head about how can you do it differently, I I, I won't survive. I won't get to where I want to go or, or last as long as I want to in this in this industry in this career. Actually, that th- thanks for your honesty, and that's that's actually very important, right? And that's something usually you don't get to read that a lot anywhere else because no, no, you, they don't. Yeah, nobody they don't teach you that. you that. They don't teach you that in school. It's that's what's such a shame. There, there's a level of of people that they graduate from school, and there's a level of entitlement that I have a degree, so it makes me good at what I do, but but when I have to tell, you know, uh, an employee that that they can't work at a company anymore, or I have to tell a manager that thinks they're doing everything right with an employee that they're not, that takes a lot of courage and a lot of of uh, discipline and 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 empathy to do that. And they don't they don't you don't learn that in the classroom. Uh, you you learn that by doing it and screwing up and getting chewed out and. And, and making mistakes and that it, it it's it's harder that's what makes it harder to be successful because you got to deal with all that in order to be good just to be good being great's a whole other thing but just to be good you have to deal with the things that no one else wants to deal with and and again when I go back and like I started all this telling you I had an art degree I had nothing going into my career and I had to make conscious decisions to to choose a path that would that would be harder, would be less likely anyone else chasing me, I guess. And it, it's funny because it all it all worked out. It got me to where I am today. And Nick, I think we, ha- we have come to the end of our interview. So thanks uh, for all sharing all your wisdoms. Before we conclude, any last words? No, I, I, I produce a podcast uh, just like you do. And, and it's great to have an opportunity. I don't talk about what I do for a living on my show. It's very separate. Than my professional life, but hopefully I have an opportunity to share this in my network. And 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 all I want to do is give back. Nassar, just having an opportunity to to share a, a success story. You forget as you climb up in in your career and being an HR executive that there's other people that were like me back in their in their twenties looking up to a position like mine. It 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 to always know no matter where you are, there's always someone looking to either be like you or or pass you. Never think you're the only one there, and it, it allows you to either inspire others or or get other people to, cha- to 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 want to be like you and and work a little bit harder to get where you are. You don't know where you are until you get where you are. So be patient. If you choose this career, be patient. You won't get good at it overnight. And God bless you if you do. And please find me on the internet and tell me how you did it because. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it wasn't easy for me, and I, I thank my lucky stars every day just to have the opportunity to help others be successful. Not just help others, which was what I said when I started in this career. It's to help others be successful because that that pays tenfold in the long run. And knowing that you were able to shape someone's career or shape one someone's success makes it every every discomfort of this career uh, all worth it. Those are wise words. And uh, Nick, uh, I wanted to thank you. Uh, it was great interviewing you. I learned a lot, a lot of uh, interesting insights. And thanks for your brutal honesty. And those That always helps. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to do this. This was great, especially doing this after I just did my own show. It's great. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, folks, for listening to this episode of the Career Medis Podcast. I have written a brief summary of the interview as part of a post on the, on the site. As always, you can listen to other other episodes uh, of the Career Medis podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn. If you enjoyed this particular episode and also learned something new, feel free to post a comment or a review. And if you really loved it, definitely go ahead and share this episode among your network. Until next time, this is Nisar Ahmed, your host for the Career Medis podcast. Thank you. Thank you.